three enrollment committees on campus. We appreciate you coming out this afternoon to participate in our um, half day educational conference this afternoon. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Um, we hope this afternoon will be enlightening. Hopefully you'll learn something new and more importantly, hopefully you'll learn something that you can take back and put into action in your daily work here on campus. Um, to get us started this afternoon, I am pleased to introduce our president, Dr. Glassman, um, to say a few words before we get started with the rest of the day. Thanks, Kimberly. I uh, appreciate uh, the invitation to come and, and say hi and uh, welcome everybody to the mini conference today. Uh, one of the things that I that I love about uh, Eastern and I've always loved about it since I've been here is the, the vibrancy that takes place on this campus, the different activities, the different events, the different conferences, uh, and everything else that, uh, that we do for ourselves and our own development as well as for our students. And uh, I have the opportunity all the time uh, to respond to parents' uh, letters and to talk to different groups and to advocate for Eastern and to talk to legislators, which I seem to do daily. Uh, and one of the things that I always harp on over and over again is that Eastern Illinois University, that students come first and they come second and they come third, that we provide individualized attention for all of our students and that every member of the Eastern Illinois University community Regardless if you're mowing the lawn, regardless if you're a teacher, regardless if you're an administrator, regardless of the, if you're the president, that everything that we do here is a shared focus and a shared value on student success. That's what we do. And it's incredible that we have brought everybody together, this entire community, with that sole mission of educating our students and having them become successful. And today's mini-conference is just another one of those elements, those parameters or components that support that truth about what we try to do at Eastern Illinois University for our students. We have faculty here, we have administrators here, we have staff here, we have students here, and it's a learning experience. Some of you know a lot of the material that's going to be discussed today in the different workshops, but you're here to just reinforce what perhaps you already know, to gain a little bit of what you might not have known, and all of it for a single, single purpose, and that is student success. And so I appreciate everybody in here taking the time to come to the mini-conference, and I really hope that you will listen and participate and learn and be engaged and active in the discussions that take place, and then do something with it. Take it back. Try something new in your classes. Try something new in your office when students come there and ask you questions and ask you for advice as advisors, as teachers, as mentors, and as staff and service personnel. We can all improve. And the improvement is going to come out in the outcomes that we produce. And those outcomes are the success of our students and the prestige and value that we all hold dear to ourselves to Eastern Illinois University. Uh, there's a lot of activity taking place in Springfield. I just put that in right now. Over the last three days, there's a lot of talk going on. Uh, certainly, uh, the discussions that uh, are taking place there demonstrate that the funding of higher education is now really the top priority of our legislators to try and resolve. Uh, so hopefully, we'll get some movement soon and get ourselves all, 100% of us, back to the 100% focus that we're here for, and that's educating our students and making them successful. But today's mini-conference, that's a step in the right direction. Thank you all for being here. They only gave me five minutes. I've used seven. <laughs> so sue me, I'm the president. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Glassman. Um, we're
we're going to transition into what we hope um, will be a session that will help set the stage for what's to come this afternoon in the breakout sessions. Um, I'm Kimberly Mook. I'm with New Student Programs in our Military Student Assistance Center, and I'm proud to help co-chair our retention committee here on campus. Um, Josh Norman, out of our Enrollment Management and Data Department, is going to join us in this presentation, as well as Dr. Sanders from CASA, who also co-chairs CORE. We're going to kind of move through this next piece, and I hope give you some data um, so that everybody understands where we might be with enrollment, retention, and graduation. To start, um, what we're going to introduce you to is our key performance indicators here on campus. Uh, Emily Stubbe is here with us who is uh, the owner of the key performance indicators and works really diligently to help the rest of us understand the data and what's happening. So um, the information you're going to see today is uh, coming through that office and Emily's work. Um, and we're just going to give you a high level um, look at the data. This document's pretty extensive. Um, and Emily would probably tell you um, every week one of us says there's something missing and we should add another data point. Um, but today we're going to look at a couple key pieces, what our uh, enrollment profile is, our retention graduation data, our program quality data, and our applicant information data as well as what we're going to focus on today. Um, so we wanted to start off and just make sure everybody knows where the enrollment markers are for the institution. So what you see here is both our graduate enrollment and our undergraduate enrollment for the last five years on campus. Um, you will see that we have continued to see a decline. Um, again, we are doing great in graduating our students, so some of the decline is because they're graduating. Um, and then also we've had those smaller entering classes, um, and so that's the mix of what you're seeing. Um, also, our transfer population um, as well as our first time freshman population has seen that small decline as we've moved through as well. Um, so that's what you're seeing reflected is total enrollment. This is head count um, for the institution. Uh, I know when I talk to people, people are always like, well, how many actually graduated? So for some of you, this might be the first time you've actually seen how many degrees have been awarded every year. So we thought we'd bring that forward for your information as well. Um, sometimes when you look at enrollment data and you're looking at what's happening in the classes, obviously graduation is um, moving through some of our classes. And so we'll see a continued decline in this graduation percentage for a little bit as those um, smaller classes have come through through. Um, we just won't have as many bodies to graduate. Um, we also included the specialists and the post-baccalaureate students in this graduation component as well, um, so that we're reflective of what's happening in some of those smaller experiences students are either coming back for or they're coming back for a small specialist degree at the graduate level that doesn't include a full, full master's. Um, program quality is a piece that we keep our eye on. So you're probably most often used to seeing average class size and our faculty to student ratio. So we wanted to again show kind of um, what is happening with that and the consistency in those numbers. Um, we did, you'll see in our publications facts that most often when you see the faculty to student ratio, it's a, it's a whole number, no, um, not a um, decimal number, but we wanted to provide the full picture for that today. So you're going to see that full um, number as well. So currently at um, an average class size of uh, 17 and then the 14.75 faculty to student ratio is where we currently sit. Um, we focus and talk a lot about time to degree. That's also been a really important thing for our work as the cost of education continues to rise. We want to make sure our students are graduating in a timely manner. So you will see that we have seen some creep in that time to degree um, in a couple of different ways. Um, for our students and so um, the group spent some time talking about how can we do that. So to 
also illustrate that time to degree, we thought you'd be interested in seeing how many credits an average graduate is taking to get to their degree. Um, so we're providing you that look today as well. Um, so you'll see it's 138 credits for our first time freshmen, uh, or 136, I'm sorry, and 132 for our transfers. And then you'll see the graduate number has been pretty consistent um, at 41. So we're really seeing the additional credits at the undergraduate level as opposed to that graduate level as students fluctuate and might change a major. Um, or sometimes our transfer populations bring in a lot of credits. Those of you that are advisors in the room and see those transfers, you know we see some of those credits come in um, and that elevates them um, in that capacity as well. Um, just some pieces to talk about where are we seeing enrollment growth. We wanted to provide some of that, um, look a little bit deeper into um, the populations. We've seen great enrollment growth in our international numbers. Kevin and his staff has been working hard on that, and so we're encouraged to continue to see that number increase. Um, we can tell you this is not the full increase because we're just giving you fall numbers, um, and we saw a really large graduate international population in the spring that's not quite reflected in these numbers yet. Um, and then also um, we had talked with Bill Elliott and asked him to show us kind of two graduate programs that we were seeing some growth. And so you're seeing what's happening um, now in art and technology as they've seen some growth in their programs of late as well. So that's kind of that high level look at what's happening in enrollment um, wise just on a day to day basis and Josh is going to talk about our new student profile. Hello, everybody. Uh, they don't usually let me out from behind my computer, so this is a little uncomfortable for me. No. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the new student profile. So the first thing we're going to talk about um, is just, if I can figure out how to work this thing, uh, new student enrollment. So uh, if you take a look at the graph here, uh, you can see uh, new freshman enrollment, new transfer enrollment, uh, graduate enrollment, first time. Um, international undergraduate and first time international graduate enrollments. Um, and that's for the last five years uh, for each fall from fall 2011 to fall 2015. Um, and so what you see there is uh, the freshmen um, with, with the overall decline but some fluctuation um, and then the transfer numbers with an overall decline. Uh, and then the graduate numbers with a little bit of a decline, but then also some stability there. Um, and like Kimberly had mentioned before, growth in both of the international populations, both graduate and, uh, and international undergraduate. And the question that I wanted to address today that uh, I feel like hasn't been brought up in a presentation before and this data hasn't actually uh, been viewed on campus before either uh, is just talking about some of the factors that have made the marketplace so competitive when it comes to recruitment um, and what has contributed to some of this decline. I, I mean, I get the question out on the street. Anytime anybody finds out I have anything to do with admissions or enrollment, it's like, well, why do you think the numbers at EIU went down? And, and they always have some sort of, uh, you know, rationale to tell me. But because I'm a data guy, I, you know, I want to come with the data. I want to say, well, th well, this is what the data says. So let's take a look at some of that. So if we look at the National Student Clearinghouse figures uh, with estimated enrollments in Illinois for the last five years from fall 2011 to fall 2015, it's just shocking. We're talking about 100,000, almost 100,000 less enrollments in the state of Illinois in five years. So there's that many less students. We're not just talking new freshmen, new transfers. We're talking uh, continuing uh, students, uh, adult learners. We're talking about graduate students, like the whole population. 100,000 less is what the National Student Clearinghouse. And I couldn't find another state in the statistics set that had those sort of figures. Um, and when you look specifically at freshmen, uh, you, so you can see there from 1996 to 2012 uh, that we're exporting at 10,000 higher students uh, than, than in 2012 than we were in 1996. And so that continues to increase, but what's really wild is a lot of states export a lot of students, but they're importing at the same time. We're not. And so we're 
consistently the second highest exporter of uh, college-bound students in the United States. And so those two factors alone uh, are huge. It makes the market so competitive uh, when it comes to recruiting new students here in Illinois. This slide takes a look at who our competitors are. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, the, the other state schools are stepping their game up, but also those, those out-of-state schools that are in our collar states, they're doing the same thing that we initiated a few years back where we started offering in-state tuition. It's really helped our out-of-state numbers grow, but at the same time, they're doing the same thing and coming into our market. And it's really interesting to see, you know, Missouri, uh, University of Missouri, Columbia there at the top and Indiana State University. They're coming in and they're taking advantage of what they know is a high exporting market. They're going up into the Chicago area and they've got a presence and they're flying students and counselors out uh, we, we have to literally be on top of our game in order to keep our students um, from exiting the state. And you can also see our in-state competitors there. Same thing there. They're ramping up their uh, enrollment management and admissions processes to make sure that it's a finely tuned machine. Each year, their processes are more are more attuned and more effective and more personal for the student. But I believe that as we move forward, and we're continuing to add uh, to our arsenal when it comes to enrollment management and recruitment, that we can be at the top of our game. We can, de we can decrease that 1501 in the next four years. I know we can because we're offering an experience that isn't offered at any of our competitors. We just have to make sure our students, the prospective students, know it. This is another uh, issue that we've had over the last few years, and uh, it really hit its peak in 2010. We started seeing um, headlines from the Chicago Tribune, which Ch Chicago, Cook County, the Collar Counties are our major markets. I mean, a lot of our students come from there, and you're seeing headlines there, 75,000 unemployed teachers in Illinois. So, you know, somebody reads that, they're just like, man, I, I don't want to be a teacher. And, and fortunately and unfortunately, our image is closely tied with education. You know, we, we are a school, we are an institution that has educated educators since 1895. You know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's not an image that we want to shake, but we also have to diversify. We have to be able to say, and we can say, we have all these other amazing programs too. We still have education because the jobs are back. I just feel like the prospective students don't know that the jobs are back. I mean, they can't, they can't find enough people for education right now. And you can also see how the, those, you know, those headlines and that media impacted our numbers from 2008 to 2015. And those are only um, bachelors of science and education majors. So just those undergraduates, you know, you can see it's almost like a thousand student difference between 2008 and 2015. So despite all of that competition and our, our, our decline in enrollment overall with new students, what's amazing is over the last 10 years, our academic profile hasn't changed. Our admissions criteria hasn't changed. We've kept everything the same. We're, we've got the same quality of student coming in we just have less of them. And that's the thing that I hear again and again is like, well, the quality of EIU students has dropped. Well, the data doesn't suggest that. The average academic profile for um, new freshmen has stayed relatively consistent over the last 10 years. And you can see the last five years here, both ACT and GPA. And just three years ago, we started keeping transfer GPA as we instituted the commitment to excellent scholarships. And as you can see, that GPA has actually, uh, has actually climbed in the last three years. A very minor amount, but those academic profiles have stayed consistent. That's not a part of our issue. We're still attracting the same caliber student. We're just attracting less of them as the market becomes more competitive. And my last slide just shows the uh, program demand for students who are coming in who are applying to EIU. And I'm telling you, that pre-med pre number has shot up in the last 10 years from like 600 to 1600. You know, students are so focused on that medical field. And so we've got so many applicants that come through and say, hey, we, I want to be pre-med. 
Um, and you can see pre-business and elementary ed and psychology and kinesiology and sports studies. Now, those all haven't grown. They're just the programs that have the largest amount of applications coming in. So even like elementary education, even though that's declined, it's almost declined by half over the last 10 years, uh, the number of applications that are coming in with that LED, it's still a significant part of our application pool. So that just gives you a, a good idea of who our new students are, that are, what's happening with those trends with our new students, and you know what they're demanding and why the market is so competitive and why we have to be the best at telling prospective students, you belong here. And the experience at EIU is like nothing else you can get anywhere else, in state or out of state. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sanders. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Carla Sanders and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about retention and graduation. She's telling me I'm too short for the mic. Can you hear me now? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so retention and graduation. Some of you who have come to the core presentations before will be familiar with this graph. We show this table all the time, but it gives you our retention and graduation from the last few years in comparison to our peers. And so we look at where Eastern stands up against other master's granting institutions across the country and where Eastern matches up against other public traditional selective institutions across the country. This is from ACT data file. So the traditional selectivity has to do with the student's ACT composite score. And it's the average of 18 to 24, which is, as you saw on Josh's slide, right where our classes have consistently been for years. And so you can see we're about 14.5% above the national graduation percentage among our peers. So our numbers for graduation and retention still look very good. We are about 5% above in our freshman to sophomore level retention rates. So again, nationally, Eastern compares very well with graduation and retention. I think many of you have heard this before, but we want to remind you that you know not only do we give an excellent education, but our students are staying, they're graduating, they're getting their degrees. Okay. Uh, the key performance indicators also are something that we look at for Eastern and we compare year to year in terms of our graduation rates. We also look at special populations in terms of the graduation rates. And so all first time, we also look at the minority students, the students who come in with a zero expected family contribution to their um, fiscal nature here on campus, and that's something that we're discovering really has a major impact on whether they stay and whether they graduate, is whether they can afford to stay. And then first-time student status. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those a bit more in a couple of minutes here. Our graduation rates, six-year, five-year, and four-year, you can see the full cohorts. And then we also have given you the minority and the first generation. Both the minority populations and the first generation cohorts have a slightly lower graduation and retention rate than the entire population. So as those populations increase, that has an impact on our overall all retention and graduation rates. Okay. CORE has um, worked for the last three years with a retention prediction model. And what that model showed us were there were seven risk factors for our students when they came in as first-time freshmen that could offer us information about how likely they were to stay and ultimately graduate. Okay. There was one factor that gave a nice leg up to students. If students came in and were an intercollegiate athlete, that helped with their retention. 
Now that doesn't mean that the rest of the class was hurt because they weren't athletes. It's not that we're suggesting everybody has to come in and be an athlete, but being an athlete does help, and that's because they get a lot of extra support over in athletics. Okay? But we did find of those seven risk factors, three of them were financially related. So the first one, the financial aid gap. A family that had a financial aid gap between their package and what they could afford to pay of $9,000 or more, those students were much less likely to be retained than students with a smaller gap. Then all of our students who come in with an expected family contribution of zero, obviously if you have an EFC of zero, you're one of our lower socioeconomic students, there's not a lot of wiggle room in terms of being able to pay for college there. So that's the second financial risk factor. And then the third one is the percentage of need met. So the students get their package, they have their contribution, and then the gap in between that, the percentage of need, if we met 43% of their need or less, there was an issue. So those three financial things, when we, when we discovered what those actual numbers were, we said, wow, this is, this is really difficult. The data that we ran was for the incoming class of 2010 and 2011. So we're hoping to run that predictor again this year and see if the new commitment to excellent scholarships have made a difference. Some of our data indicate that they have. Mm -hmm. Then we also learned that students with a high school GPA of a 2.84 or lower struggled. They struggle academically. They struggle with preparedness. Uh, students of Hispanic origin were less likely to stay than other students. That is the only ethnicity marker that came up when we ran the retention predictor. And then attendance at EIU Reads programs. So if students came in and on the very first day they decided to sleep in and not show up for their EIU reading circle, that indicated motivation, which indicates to us you're not going to be with us the following fall. And so there, those are the, the predictors that we saw. Um, we also found some of our majors, some areas of study, were more at risk than others. There were 10 programs on the list, as well as students who are undecided. And I think, you know, a lot of schools struggle with what to do with the undeclared population. They haven't figured out a course of study yet, and sometimes students will then drop out to figure things out and come back later or not at all. So we look at retention by admission type, so our standard admits and our special populations. So the first two bars that you see there are all of the special admits. Then the next one is all of the standard admits. The standard admit retention rates remain relatively steady. All has dipped a little bit, but our special populations has um, come up a little bit, but they are now a larger part of our freshman class, and they are still below the level that we would like to see in our aspirational levels. Uh -huh. These are the, this graph shows you the shifts in the financial factors over the last three years. These are the incoming cohorts. And so you can see that for the financial aid gap, we're making some progress there. We have a smaller portion of the class that actually has that risk factor. So that's a good thing. And uh, the CTE scholarships and some of the other things have contributed to that. Uh, the zero EFC, we have seen a bit of a drop in the percentage of the class coming in at zero expected family contribution, but we're still at 25%. So again, we've seen a bit of a drop, which is a good thing, but we still have a significant portion of the population at that marker. Then the percentage of need met, um, the students with that risk factor, uh, that's gone up. And so that, that is a concern, especially since we've gone from 19% to 35% in two years. Mm -hmm. 
And then the number of students that had no financial risk factor that didn't fall into one of these three categories has gone down. So 35% of the freshman class was at that point. But you know what that means? Do your math. 65% had at least one of those risk factors. So that is something that we are paying a lot of attention to and looking for uh, you know, ways to help our students. Okay. So these are the retention numbers by those risk factors. So you saw the percentage of the class. This is the, the retention rate. You can see the financial gap is 78% uh, from the fall, the, the new fall students in uh, 2014 to, where, to coming back. Fall 15, obviously we don't have the 15 to 16 numbers yet. 76% okay. for the zero EFC, 68% for that percentage of need met, and you will remember there was a higher percentage of the class there, so that really has us worried for uh, the retention rate for 2016. Okay. And then 78% for no indicator. Okay. The retention by academic program, so we looked at and the entire university retention, so all the students, all the majors, undeclared, et cetera. Then the students in those 10 at-risk programs and undeclared. And then the students who were majoring in something that was a not, not at-risk program. That is the steadiest retention numbers we have seen yet. It's just straight across the board. Um, but we have seen a, a dip in those at-risk majors. And so CORE has talked with those programs individually and shared you know, d data with them and talked about what we can do about that. Um, and we are working on special programs for those undeclared students, okay? So that is retention and graduation in a, a fast and speedy nutshell. Um, I don't believe that Kimberly said, but we are going to put these slides as well as the handouts and the presentations for all of the, the sessions today on a website. We'll be sending that out to everybody so they will be accessible. So if you want to take them back and memorize these charts and graphs, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, and we do want you to share with people who weren't able to come today. We have a, a minute or two to take some questions if anybody has anything at this point, but then we need to skedaddle to our next sessions. Any questions at the moment? Uh, Josh? Josh, you gave the average ACT scores over a certain period of time. Has there been a change in the distribution of ACT scores over time? Well, the, the total distribution is, uh, is actually something that we didn't calculate in the KPIs, but is totally something that uh, I can put together and send to you, Mark. That wouldn't be a problem whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. I could do that for you. Not that I'm a part of the of the mini conference, but uh, at IBHE on Monday we met, and the presidents uh, all met there too. And there was one statistic that came out, one piece of data that I thought was was very interesting. I had heard about it anecdotally, but I had not seen the actual figures. And uh, what it was was for each of the universities, the public universities uh, in Illinois, it was a comparison of the graduation rate of those students that come in under MAP grants uh, versus the peer group for that university of the graduation of, of their students. Uh, so we're looking at lower income students and they made a point and uh, they said it uh, during the IBHE uh, that uh, Eastern Illinois University is well above every other university in the state of Illinois, that we have the greatest success of graduating students who come in with the lower or the zero uh, uh, EFC, which is really, really nice. And when you looked at the uh, nine universities that they had there, there were about four universities that outbeat, if you will, their peer institutions, and so the other five were below, 
And then when you looked at uh, Eastern, it was just well and above, it was just hugely above any of the other universities in comparison. So even though it looks like we have some improvements that we need to do and some challenges to move certain groups forward in graduation, and we will, and we need to do that, when we start to compare ourselves to other institutions in Illinois, we are doing a much better job. And it's being recognized by the state. So I think that that's a, a nice thing to share. And that's probably a good place to end. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we are going to get ready to transition to the next sessions. In your program, it does show what rooms those sessions are in. Um, and then we will be closing out together as a group, but we're going to do that upstairs. And you'll see on your program, that's going to be in the Charleston Mattoon room um, today as well. Um, so we have some time where we'll be able to move into those next sessions. You'll see those in your program. Um, and then Josh and Carla and myself um, will be around this afternoon. Emily is also here this afternoon, who holds a lot of that key performance indicator. So if you have questions about that, please don't hesitate to connect to us as we move throughout the day. Um, we are keeping Josh hop in, hop in today. He's got a couple of presentations, um, but we'll be around to answer any additional questions. Um, and so with that, we will excuse everybody to head upstairs for that 145 session. Mm -hmm.